Been spending most our lives living in a gangster's paradise. Been spending most our lives living in a gangster's paradise. Keep spending most our lives living in a gangster's paradise. Keep spending most our lives living in a gangster's paradise. Three, two, one. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, good evening, friends, and welcome to the seventh episode of Crime and Punishment, a very legal podcast that is absolutely apolitical. This is the podcast of the Invictus Law Firm PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida. You can check out the uh, website for the law firm at augustusinvictus.com. We will also have a website launched for the podcast uh, itself in weeks to come. I am here tonight with my trusty co-host, Tiger Jen. Tiger, how are you doing tonight, man? Good. I'm here. That is excellent. Good to show up. So uh, today is, of course, the Ides of March. And uh, I forgot to... Well, my kids are always on this show, but uh, you will, like my children, all of you listeners out there, get random history lessons from me, like I'm your dad. So today is the Ides of March. That means it is the anniversary of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Important day. Saturday, perhaps a more important day, is the spring equinox. So you might think of spring as being March, you would be wrong. Spring actually begins on the spring equinox. That is the time between the winter solstice and the summer solstice, right smack dab in the middle, and that happens this Saturday. And then, on the 28th of March, you have the full moon. And the reason I tell you this is so that you will know, and so my kids will know, because I don't think I lectured them on this this weekend. That uh, Easter always falls after the full the first full moon after the spring equinox. Most people don't know that. That is a fact. So the spring equinox is Saturday. Full moon is the twenty eighth, and so the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. That's Easter, April fourth. So you learned something today. And we're only 30 seconds into the program, so you're welcome. Now, speaking of learning things, last week we had the second half of our discussion of the Bill of Rights. So the first hour, uh, two weeks ago now, uh, we discussed the first through fourth amendments and realized, well, we're certainly not going to finish the first ten amendments. So we did a second episode on the Bill of Rights, and so we did the fifth through tenth amendments. Uh, problem being, the second week of the Bill of Rights episodes, I was fasting, and I will confess to you, I hate fasting. Some people do it for health benefits, some people, they feel better when they fast, some people feel more energetic, they feel lighter, they, they go about their day. I hate it. I, there, is, there are few things in this world, few spiritual disciplines, few physical disciplines that I hate more than fasting. Perhaps it just reminds me of poverty. I don't know, but I don't like it. I'm not on my A game. Last week was one of those days. So, 
Uh, there were points in there that were just, I was like, all right, let's move on. I can't even, I can't even think straight about this right now. Uh, you might have noticed that, dear listeners. So, I have put in the description to this episode the link for a Hillsdale course on the Constitution. So please feel free to shore up your knowledge on the Constitution. Don't take our word for it. Uh, every, every American should know the Constitution anyway, and the Bill of Rights, but I hope that uh, we were able to at least tell you the major do's and don'ts when you are approached by the police. Uh, they were Know Your Rights episodes, so hopefully you learned something in there. Um, the due process issue, yeah, we really, we butchered that. I was just not having it. So I found uh, on Eustia, that's law.justia.com. It's a good website, has a lot of cases, has uh, definitions, has just a lot of good information on legal things um, for lawyers and non-lawyers. I like this website, and I'm sure you will too. That is not a paid advertisement by Eustia. We just like it. So I was looking on there, reading about due process, and I found this neat little tidbit. The content of due process is a historical product that traces all the way back to chapter 39 of Magna Carta, in which King John promised that, quote, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him nor send upon him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land, end quote. So law of the land and due process are basically synonymous. Generally speaking, it means that there has to be some kind of law, right? They can't just put you in jail without you having broken some kind of law. They can't exile you or execute you without there being a law. And you have to have a hearing on that, by the way. That's procedural due process. So they can't just, out of your hearing, you know, with you not present, say, well, this guy broke whatever law or didn't break a law, but we're going to execute this guy. That would be a violation of due process, right? So, uh, lots about that on Eustia, lots about that in the Hillsdale course. Um, so, my apologies for being a little spaced out last week. So, big news in the past couple days. I got a notification this morning. We will get to, by the way, the, the point of this episode, but there are a lot of introductory comments today. Uh, I got a notification that the FBI had served something like 800 warrants and seized something around 1,600 cell phones surrounding the uh, Capitol quote-unquote riots, the, the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. We have done our best not to talk about that because it seems highly politicized and we are not a political program. All we want to talk about is the law, so don't kick us off YouTube. However, this same notification I got said that this is now the largest prosecution in the history of the United States. And that is something. Bigger than the communist scare, the red scare. Bigger than 9-11. If I remember correctly, they are looking to arrest 500 more people right now. That's wild. Like 500 out of 800 who are allegedly inside of that building. Biggest prosecution in U.S. history. I think we talked about Milligan last week, didn't we? Or the, the week before, Tiger? Case of John Milligan, kidnapped out of his room, and uh, they put him in a military tribunal, and they said, no, you can't do that even during Civil War, if the courts aren't shut down. If we talked about it, I completely forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been fasting, too. <laughs> um, so, John Milligan was a sympathizer with the South during the Civil War. He was in Indiana. And uh, he, he wasn't just, like, you know, posting social media about, yeah, well, these guys might be right. Uh, he was apparently a sympathizer of the sort that provides supplies 
or that was at least part of a group that supplied uh, the South, or that was attempting to supply the South. The, the details on that I'm quite murky on, but I can tell you that he was a lawyer, and they came and they straight up kidnapped him out of his house, and they put him on trial with a military tribunal. And after the war, all political questions are over, and now the Supreme Court can judge based on the law, and the Supreme Court says you can't do that. You cannot put a civilian on trial in a military court, not when the civil courts are still open. That was the standard. Now, the significance of that, the reason I bring this up, is that even in the Civil War, we didn't have this kind of insanity with a prosecution of 500 people hundreds upon hundreds of search warrants all across the United States seizing cell phones for people being inside of a building. And I think the last time we brought up Milligan, it was to point out, I think we were talking about speedy trial, that even during the Civil War, the courts in this country were not shut down. And yet for a full year now, it is now March 15th, for a full year now, the courts have been shut down in this country because of COVID. So we keep trying not to talk about COVID or mask mandates or the Proud Boys or January 6th and the Capitol riots. But when you make it the biggest prosecution in U.S. history, how do you not talk about that on a legal podcast? So... We're going to have to talk about it sooner or later, but tonight, tonight we're going to talk about the very people who are conducting this prosecution, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They're the ones getting the search warrants. They're the ones going around arresting all these guys. They're the ones promoting this. They're the ones behind the biggest prosecution in U.S. history. Same guys, if you've ever seen Public Enemy with uh, Johnny Depp and Christian Bale. Same guys who were out there getting gangsters, which is to say getting their faces in the newspapers to get more funding for their own department. FBI has a long and sordid history. And tonight we're going to read from a book called Police State, How America's Cops Get Away with Murder. It's by Jerry Spence. Some of you might know Jerry Spence as the attorney for Randy Weaver. Now, the first chapter in this book is about the Weaver case. It's about how the FBI murdered his son, then murdered his wife, and then tormented them for days on end. We're not going to read that chapter because we love Big Brother, and it's a very political subject to talk about how the FBI would you know, go after somebody accused of the real worst crime in America, which is being white nationalist. We would never talk about that in any fashion that would denigrate the FBI because we are not political. We are going to skip ahead to chapter two in this book, Police State. And chapter two is titled, The Secret Lies of the FBI. Now this is about a guy who like Milligan and yours truly, and my trusty co-host, is a lawyer. Because the FBI is no respecter of persons. The FBI will arrest Roger Stone, of all people. They will arrest Nixon. They will dig up George Washington and arrest him if it would get more funding to the FBI. So, Tiger, unless you've got any introductory comments, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start... I have plenty of introductory comments. Let's hear them. I'll make them quick. So first, uh, regarding who is Jerry Spence, you're right that one of his most famous cases was uh, defending Randy Weaver and Ruby Ridge. But I think it is also relevant to say that he is the most successful trial lawyer in America. He something like the past couple of decades, he has a long winning streak of both criminal and civil trials where he literally never lost a case. And when, as you read this, 
keep in mind that a lot of his the narrative that he gives in this book and his writings is much like if not exactly the way that he conducts his trials he makes a point of telling the judge and the jury what the emotional toll is to his client and he will have them relive the experiences he'll have witnesses on the stand reenacting they'll get down from the stand and reenact the part what happened what the other person was doing so keep that in mind as you read this that if this is all relevant to the jury relevant to the judge you want your the court to know what the real human toll was and and um, another thing that I would like to introduce with, because a lot of my interjections are going to be regarding the right to privacy, this is not a constitutional right. This is one that was found in common law. And William Blackstone wrote about eavesdropping as being a crime. He defined it as listening in on someone and then disseminating the information to frame slanderous and mischievous tales. And in the United States, privacy laws, they didn't come about until 1905. The state of Georgia was the first state to recognize a common tort of action for privacy invasions. And really privacy laws did not come until a law review article the only law review article in U.S. history that was read and paid attention to, it was titled The Right to Privacy. And this is still quoted to this day in the United States Supreme Court regarding privacy actions. So um, just as a way of introduction, that is where our privacy laws come from that you will see the FBI trample over in this reading. True. Yeah, and this reading has more than just that, and it has more than just setting up an innocent person. It also has corruption in a federal court with the judges, because federal judges are not above corruption. Uh, it has everything you could imagine going wrong in a case, went wrong in this case. Um, I did have someone, uh, two different things before, right before the show started. Uh, one, pointing out to me that um, there... <laughs> There was a, a job ad by the FBI on LinkedIn, and it said that their mission <laughs> their mission was to uphold the Constitution. Massive LOL on that one. Uh, we have someone in the comments here asking to explain the difference between FBI and MBI. Uh, MBI is an Orlando organ well a Central Florida organization. And it is a collaborative effort between all the law enforcement agencies in Central Florida, including the Orange County Sheriff's Office, the Orlando Police Department, um, the State Attorney's Office, and a bunch of other places. Uh, so it, it is an intelligence agency, I guess, but it's more like a vice squad uh, here in Orlando. Like I believe Miami most Vice. every state has something like that. Yeah. I often hear of things like the... Of uh, uh, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, period, right. and things like that, and I believe that it's essentially just the state version of the FBI. They try to be, yeah, they try to be. Uh, just as corrupt, I can tell you that. But uh, the other thing that came in right before the show, uh, my friend told me that in Scotland, they passed a law, I don't know whether you heard about this, Tiger, they passed a law that actually criminalizes speech. Um, so that if you say something that offends somebody and it causes them distress, you can now be imprisoned for up to seven years. Have you heard about this? I have not, and I'm hoping that the news is exaggerating it. Uh, this appears to be the statute, actually. <laughs> A person commits an offense if the person communicates to another person material that is that a reasonable person would consider to be threatening, abusive, or insulting. And uh, a reasonable person would consider the behavior or the communication of the material to be likely to result in hatred 
being stirred up against such a group. A person who commits an offense under this section is liable on conviction or indictment to imprisonment for a term of not exceeding seven years. Wild. Overturning a thousand years of jurisprudence in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got to get to the bottom of that. I don't, you know, uh, I'm just hearing about this. I have not researched this, so don't take my word for it, but... Uh, that was what I heard. If right that's before the word to the statute, I hope it would be void for being overly broad. I mean, you never know these days. <laughs> uh, in, yeah. in America, certainly we would challenge it for being overly broad, but who knows over there in the UK anymore? <clears throat> All right, so introductions being over, let's start with the secret lies of the FBI. Brandon Mayfield was a lawyer just getting by. He looked like a forlorn professor with his beard and glasses, and he wasn't the kind who sprayed large quantities of charisma around. He worked in his smallish, rented law office west of downtown Portland, Oregon. Mona, his wife, was born in Egypt. That turned out to be her greatest sin. But she had an open, winning personality and acted as his secretary. The two of them likely would have toiled in obscurity, helping immigrants and the poor, if not for a series of events that began across the globe in Madrid, Spain on March 11, 2004. That morning, a group of terrorists, now thought to be related to Al-Qaeda, set off a series of coordinated bombings on the Madrid commuter uh, train system that killed 190, uh, 191 people outright and wounded 1,800 others. The internet images that made their way around the world were of bloody, mutilated body after body laid next to one another in a straight line that stretched for nearly two city blocks, each waiting its turn to be identified, tagged, and hauled away. I don't know about you, Tiger, but... I actually remember very vividly the images that were all over the news that day and for days afterward. So this was a bombing in Madrid back in 2004, Madrid, Spain. Brandon Mayfield is on the other side of the planet in Portland, Oregon. His wife was born in Egypt. Now. You might notice some parallels in this story, dear listener, between the prosecution of Muslims after 9-11 and in the, the initiation of the worldwide war on terror and today's situation with Proud Boys, white nationalists, all the wretched scum of the earth. You'll notice a lot of parallels here about the FBI targeting a certain group, making political hay of it, making up evidence, getting experts that just don't know their elbow from a hole in the ground. Uh, you'll see a lot of things that you've seen the past three years as applied to a different group that are targets of the FBI. A wounded mother, half-naked and too shocked to weep, holding her dead baby in her arms, the tiny corpse emptying its blood on the pavement, the screams of the injured, the moans of the dying, the hollering of ambulance drivers, the police shouting orders and sirens crying, the crazy cacophony of chaos and death. The doors of hell had been blown wide open. Brandon Mayfield, along with millions of others, read about the bombing in the morning paper. Horrible. What's happening in this world, he thought. Then he poured himself another cup of coffee. The Spanish police lifted fingerprints from a blue plastic bag that had once contained the detonators for the bomb, and they promptly submitted digital photographs of the fingerprints to Interpol, an organization of police from 190 countries that cooperate in solving international crime. When the latent print unit of the FBI received the print from Interpol, an agent turned to the FBI's Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System, IAFIS, for help. The FBI claims its computer stores the largest biometric database in the world and houses the fingerprints and criminal histories of more than 70 million subjects in its criminal master file, along with more than 34 million prints of civilians. Included in its criminal database are fingerprints from, quote, 73,000 known and suspected terrorists, end quote. The FBI's computer automatically performs searches for the print in question by optically scanning the submitted print and comparing it with those in its files. This computer has eyes. 
think of just the the massive scale of this system that the FBI and remember this is 2004 almost 20 years ago this is the technology they had 34 million prints of civilians 34 million prints civilians not people who are registered with the government because they're military, they have to be fingerprinted. <clears throat> Not felons who have to be fingerprinted because they've been convicted. 34 million prints of civilians, generally speaking. 73,000 known and suspected terrorists. That's a huge number. And how do they classify those people? That's untold. But we trust the FBI to have a system of this magnitude that houses the information of regular civilians and targets people that it calls suspected and known terrorists that we have no oversight of. Another yeah. note is that um, fingerprint science has been coming under attack in the past few years to the point that some research is calling it a pseudoscience. Um, I don't know how true that is or how accurate it is, but just as a matter of fact, it's being challenged more and more in court, although my understanding is that typically if you, I mean, just good luck with challenging fingerprint data in, in a court and in front of a jury. I mean, everybody's been conditioned that it's at and maybe it is I have no idea but I I have uh, some good sources that are saying that it's really not reliable at all and you get one expert to say a fingerprint matches another one says it doesn't match I don't know but this is very relevant to hear because of what's coming up well you know it used to be sound science that you could feel a person's head and see what is protruding and what is diminishing and you could know by the shape of their skull uh, their personality and whether they were impulsive or whether they were um, criminal uh, whether they were long-term thinkers um, just by the shape of certain parts of your head that was a science called phrenology that is no longer considered a science no, it's racist. Yeah. Well, there's... Okay, that's a different subject, but it, it used to be a very specific... You know, you have this uh, lobe of the brain, not, not even the brain, like the shape of your skull itself would determine your personality and everything about you. And so they could look at a person and say, that person is a criminal based on our scientific study of what he looks like. And there's a reason that science, that so-called science, was discontinued. So, you know, when you read a story like the one we're reading, and you hear that fingerprint science is being questioned, well, remember, they, they also used to depend on polygraph tests. And now, no court in this country is going to allow a polygraph test to prove the truth of anything. Because people figured out how to beat polygraph tests, and people figured out they're just not scientifically reliable. So when you read a story like this one about fingerprints, you kind of think, well, maybe we shouldn't have been depending on fingerprints all these years. Maybe there are innocent people in jail because careerist law enforcement officers will get up there and talk out of their rear ends about things they just don't bloody know. They will just plain make things up to put somebody in jail, to get another notch in their belt, to move up the corporate ladder, or governmental ladder. The FBI gave the Spanish fingerprint an unpretentious name, Latent Fingerprint Number 17, LFP 17 for short. Now remember, this is a fingerprint off of what? A, a bag in which the detonation materials were in and it's like a partial fingerprint off this bag. So, on March 20, on March 15th, oh my God, that's synchronicity right there. 
This is the anniversary. That is a little spooky. Yeah, how about that? Or maybe we planned it. Yes, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> we we prep so much for the show. We <laughs> we have the next 60 weeks lined up with date coincidences. So on March 15th, 2004, the FBI's computer dutifully listed 20 candidates as possible matches. Brandon Mayfield was on the computer's list, ranked the fourth most likely to match the print on the blue plastic bag. Now, the computer also told the FBI that Brandon was 38 years old, a former U.S. Army officer with an honorable discharge, and a practicing Oregon lawyer, and that he had never been convicted of any crime and had not been outside the United States since 1993 when he, his wife, and three children visited Mansoura, Egypt, Mona's place of origin. One thing we know, and we know it because we've been taught it since we were old enough to watch cop movies on TV, the agents of the FBI are honorable, super competent men who keep us safe, and no loyal American would doubt a fingerprint identification made by the FBI. I was taught that in law school, and I, this is Jerry Spence speaking, by the way, not me. I was taught that in law school, and I took careful notes. Quote, if an FBI expert testifies that the fingerprint on the murder weapon belongs to your client, well, it belongs to your client, period. End quote. It hurts me now, it, excuse me, it hurts me to now report that our belief in the infallibility of the FBI's fingerprint experts has been little more than a cultural lie. Once the fingerprint computer identifies an initial list of subjects, human eyes take over for a closer evaluation. <clears throat> Agent Alfred, a senior fingerprint examiner, concluded that Brandon's left index fingerprint matched LFP-17, the fingerprint on the blue plastic bag. That erroneous identification was confirmed when the FBI, following its protocol, submitted the print for verification to Mr. Smart, a so-called independent fingerprint examiner. Mr. Smart had once been an employee of the FBI, but for reasons not clear on the record, he'd left the Bureau and was thereafter hired on a contract basis to do fingerprint examinations. During his term as an FBI employee, Smart had been reprimanded on at least three occasions concerning his work in fingerprint identification. When a tragedy of errors gets rolling, its momentum is hard to stop. Had the FBI given even a passing, competent squint to the photo furnished by the Spanish police, it would have been obvious from the relative position of all the prints on the blue plastic bag that LFP-17 could not have come from Mr. Mayfield's left index finger. Moreover, there were but a few points of similarity between 17 and Mayfield's print, not enough for any qualified agent to declare a match not to mention the important dissimilarities such as interruptions in what the experts call the ridge flow. That's how an innocent American citizen can one day wake up facing the death penalty as a mass murderer. And what's your lawyer going to say when the FBI expert slowly turns his sad smile on the jurors and tells them that the fingerprint belongs to you? Super important to note, that is not just this case. This, what Jerry Spence calls a tragedy of errors. How many times have we heard of cases where one law enforcement officer or one investigator gets something wrong? Then the next one gets something wrong. And then those two can't lose face, so they back up each other's stories. And then everybody else on the force says, well, I know these guys. They can't be wrong. You know, if they were wrong, they would have said something. I know their work. These are good agents. Good cops, good deputies, good whatever they are. This happens more than you would like to know. Remember that scene in Fight Club? <clears throat> when they're talking, uh, no, uh, Jack is talking to the woman on the plane. And he's explaining the malfunctions in the car. And there's a total, there's a recall on these cars. And he's saying that if the cost of the recall, you know, is less than whatever it is, than, than making it right, right? Or if the, the cost of the, the uh, payout is less than the cost of a recall, we don't do one. 
that's kind of the same principle here. We don't recall these things. We just keep going with it. And you don't want to know how many times this happens. The woman talks to Jack and she says, uh, which car company do you work for? And he says, a major one. You don't want to know how many times this happens where the FBI or the Orange County Sheriff's Office or whatever your local police department is, they get something wrong. And rather than investigate what has happened, they just keep going with it. If you knew how many times that happened, you would never have any faith in the legal system again. External factors were also in play. Not only was Mona born Muslim, she had convinced her Baptist husband, that is Mr. Mayfield, to convert to Islam. By 2004, a virtual crime in itself in the eyes of many Americans. What's more, the FBI was still feeling the lash of its 9-11 failures. Solving the Madrid bombing in record time could restore the FBI's tarnished luster in the eyes of the public and loosen Congress's purse strings for the Bureau. A lot packed into that one little paragraph there. First of all, like I said, a lot of parallels between the way FBI went after Muslims after 9-11 and the way FBI is now going after another targeted demographic that America hates unanimously. Super political, but the FBI will always tell you, we're not political. We don't take sides. We don't care about politics. We just want people not to hate each other, people not to commit crimes, people not to bomb things or hurt each other or get in fights. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to prevent that. Another thing to note in this paragraph is Mr. Spence points out that the FBI was still feeling the lash of its 9-11 failures. This is where we start to feel like old men, where I have to recognize that many people in the audience probably don't remember 9-11. My kids who are listening to this program were not born yet. Some people don't remember what it's like or what it was like to have America before 9-11 and be able to contrast what we now call America with pre-9-11 America. It's a completely different country. Yeah, we're more safe now. Well, thank God for that. But the FBI got pummeled after 9-11 because there were reports that they knew this was going to happen. They knew it and they did nothing. They didn't investigate it. They failed. And 3,000 people died because of the FBI's incompetence. A lot of people were mad at the FBI because of 9-11. So they started going full bore against this targeted demographic, pulling out all the stops. Uh, we had a lot of constitutional fights on, and it wasn't just the FBI. It was a perfect storm of, you know, war profiteers, the Bush-Cheney administration. Um, you had carte blanche, thanks to 9-11, to bomb whatever country you wanted to, and the rest of the world could get behind it or not. We didn't care. So the FBI was also given carte blanche, just absolute blank check, do whatever you want. And that was back in the days when the liberal media would actually try to hold people accountable for these kind of abuses. Now, the media are the biggest cheerleaders for the FBI throwing the Constitution right out the window. That alone is surreal, that change over the past 20, because it's now 2021, over the past 20 years, watching the media go from trying to crucify Bush and Cheney and John Yu uh, and everybody back then that was part of that administration that was you know, sending people to Guantanamo when they could have been in civil trial, at least that was the argument. I'm not taking one side or the other. But back then, the news would try to hold them accountable for violating the Constitution. And you think about that 20 years later, and it's surreal to think that they would do that. Because now, you read the news, and they, every, every article, every article is encouraging these people to do this. 
totally different country. And the final part of the last sentence here, loosen Congress's purse strings for the Bureau. There's a long history of the FBI going back a century, right? And when J. Edgar Hoover comes on the scene, he was just a genius, diabolical genius at getting all of this funding and recognition. He, ha he was the, I don't want to name a name to be political, but let's just say he was the precursor to one of our social media stars, right? This guy understood the power of the media in growing a governmental organization. So he would go after communists, which everybody hated at the time. They would round them up. They would exile them, deport them. They just got rid of communists. That was a big win. Then they would go after gangsters. Everybody hated gangsters or loved them during the Depression because they were robbing banks and everybody hated the banks. But the FBI had an easy target with bank robbers. A lot of bank robberies, it's very sexy. When the G-men can run down a bank robber and take him out, that's just, you can't buy that sort of publicity. You can't buy that sort of story to sell the FBI, and that's exactly what they did. They sold it to the American public. They got lots of money out of it, grew the FBI. Under Hoover, it became massive. And then it started falling away after Hoover's death, to the point where in 2001, when 9-11 happened, it was by their standards, certainly not by my standards, but by their standards, underfunded, without leadership. It was, you know, disjointed. Uh, it was really 9-11 that made the modern FBI in a big way. So, to continue, on March 20th, 2004, the FBI issued its formal report proclaiming to the world that Print 17 belonged to Brandon Mayfield. That splendid bit of FBI science transformed a loyal American, husband and father, and ethical lawyer with a spotless record into a member of an international conspiracy that was responsible for the mass murders in Madrid. You know, sometimes I, especially all last year, I would think to myself, this is really unjust what has happened to me. And how? Could this happen? It's so insane that it, it's difficult to wrap your head around when, you know, seven different law enforcement agencies across multiple states, you know, will rope in all the, I'm just, it's crazy. How, what, what, what do you call it earlier? A, a, a error, part, a tragedy of errors, something like that. It's crazy to think of how something like that could happen, but then you look at Brandon Mayfield's case. Mayfield was on the other side of the bloody world, had absolutely no contact with these people, didn't know these people, read about it in the newspaper. Next thing you know, FBI is issuing a statement to the world saying that this print belongs to this poor guy in Portland, Oregon. Unbelievable. Imagine that guy's day on March 20th, 2004, when he finds out because everybody he knows is calling him saying, hey man, what's this about in the news? Think about what a surreal day that was for him. And it's because the FBI is incompetent, because the FBI screwed up and they destroyed this man's life. But the Spanish police provided their report to the FBI. They advised the Bureau that they'd compared print LFP-17 to Brandon's, and their conclusion was no match. How dare a cluster of cops from a minor member of the European Union like Spain contest the match made by the FBI, the world's ultimate authority on fingerprint identification? In fact, a unit supervised chief in the latent print unit of the FBI, Stephen Mayer, once testified that in the entire history of fingerprint examination, the FBI had never made a misidentification in a court case. He said, never. Still, 
And the Spanish no match report caused serious rev reverberation, reverberations, excuse me, at the FBI. A false positive fingerprint identification could result in the revocation of the professional licenses held by the erring FBI examiners, and could even lead to a revocation of the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors certification of the FBI itself. And this Mayfield mess could bring on a congressional investigation that might fracture the FBI's credibility worldwide. So, a lot packed into that paragraph. If anyone successfully questioned a fingerprint misidentification, if somebody pointed out the FBI was just plain wrong about misidentifying a fingerprint in a criminal case, that FBI agent who made the misidentification would lose his professional license. It would be revoked. And not only that, the FBI itself would lose its certification. Do you understand how, how earth-shattering that would be if the FBI, because of its own incompetence, lost its certification under the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors? It would destroy the credibility of the FBI. And not just in this country, but every country in the bloody world depends on the FBI being infallible. It is, it is dystopian to think that the FBI has such credibility that everybody in the world believes, genuinely believes, that they are infallible. And that they would never mistake something like a routine fingerprint identification. My God, that could never be. Because the entire illusion that we have created worldwide would be destroyed overnight. Worse still, in the two years before the Madrid bombings, lawyers had mounted challenges in several federal courts, claiming that fingerprint examination as a science did not meet the evidentiary standards required by the United States Supreme Court in a case referred to as Daubert. The very reputation of fingerprint analysis itself was at stake. The FBI couldn't risk public embarrassment, and despite having been officially told by the Spanish that 17 was not a match to Brandon Mayfield, the FBI continued to insist its Mayfield print match was correct. Am I saying, this is Jerry Spence talking, <clears throat> am I saying the FBI was willing to convert an innocent American citizen into an international terrorist and subject him to the ultimate penalty, death, in order to save the jobs of its agents and the reputation of the Bureau itself? Is he saying that? Given the right circumstances, might our revered G-men end up sending one of us, an innocent American citizen, to the death house? On April 21st, 2004, to shore up this bureaucratic crime, the FBI sent its agents to Madrid to meet with their Spanish counterparts. Their mission? To convince the Spanish that the FBI's match was correct but the Spanish remained steadfast. Seventeen and Brandon's prints were not a match, they insisted. Now that is a spectacular statement. The mission of the FBI in going to Madrid to meet their Spanish counterparts, their mission was not to go investigate the crime. Think about this. The FBI leaves the United States, goes across the Atlantic Ocean, shows up in Madrid, and they're not there to investigate what happened. Their mission is to convince the Spanish that their match of the fingerprint is correct. I am up in arms about this. You can probably hear the upsetness in my voice because this I was just dealing with this earlier today in a local case. And I don't know how many times this is, I, I have lost count at how many times this has happened. The cops get a report, somebody accuses somebody of something, the cops get it, and they don't investigate it, they just arrest the person. And then, when the person is arrested, and then they find out, holy crap, we screwed up. 
we better fix this now. Their fixing it isn't investigating what actually happened. Their fixing it isn't getting down to the bottom of what happened and how this false accusation was made. Their mission at that point is to prove why they were right to begin with. They don't investigate the case. They shore up their case, to use Jerry Spence's own phrase. Their job at that point is not to figure out what happened or to investigate the alleged crime. Their job is to convince the prosecutor and the media and the jury and the judge that this person committed the crime because now their reputation is on the line. They cannot be wrong. Otherwise, people around here might start thinking, these people are not infallible. They might start thinking, there are innocent people in jail right now. Or worse, there are innocent people in prison, convicted on false charges. After its erroneous fingerprint match, the FBI made application to a secret court created by Congress, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. That secret court authorized the FBI to place electronic listening devices, or bugs, in the intimate rooms of the Mayfield family home and to make covert sneak and peek searches of their house. This was a huge issue after 9-11. There were secret courts, they were getting secret warrants, it was totally just the wild west for intelligence agencies, and they were spying on American citizens. And this is 20 years ago now. And t to my mind, it has never been resolved. This has never been resolved to my satisfaction, where we know for a fact that the FBI can't get these warrants under the Patriot Act or go to the, these secret courts and get these things. Like, they say that it's being resolved, that this could never happen. But they also say that COINTELPRO was shut down, right, back in the 60s. <clears throat> FBI would never run a program like COINTELPRO on American soil again. That would be crazy if the FBI were targeting people for their political speech like they did back in the 60s. But we know for a fact that that is a lie. Of course they do that. So do they still plant bugs in people's homes? Do they still resort to sneak and peek searches of houses? You bet your boots they do. The agents discovered Oh, excuse me. Soon, FBI agents were following the Mayfields and putting their modest home under surveillance. The agents discovered when the kids would be in school and Brandon and Mona off to work at Brandon's law office. Then the agents surreptitiously entered the Mayfield house in broad daylight. Some of the best lock pickers in the business are respected members of the FBI. The irony here is that the FBI was about to terrorize innocent American citizens in its proclaimed war against terror. History now permits us to watch these G-men at work. See them in the Mayfield home, sneaking, searching, snooping into the family's private drawers and closets. See them handling the family's most personal possessions, copying the kids' computers and hard drives, and taking DNA samples from the butts of Mona's camel cigarettes. Watch them as they end microphones under the bed and under the breakfast table and affix taps on their phones. Yes, I hear those who are unwashed in the troubled waters of our times innocently saying, What's the big deal? I have nothing to hide. Personally, I have everything to hide in the privacy of my home. Animals from rabbits to bears and birds from wrens to eagles have nothing to hide. But their hole, their den, their nest is their private, infinitesimal part of the universe that belongs only to them. Put your hand on an old hen who's sitting on her eggs and see what happens to your hand. It wasn't long before the Mayfields began to feel something was awry. When they came home, they found their door locks locked in the opposite order. The upper lock was now open and the lower lock locked. Then one day, the electric clock was a half hour slow. Someone must have turned off the electricity so the house alarms would be disconnected. Nothing seemed to be missing. But Shane, then 14, had been reading 1984 and was beginning to believe they'd entered the nightmare world of George Orwell. 
He shouldn't believe everything he reads, his father advised. They'd committed no crime, except, of course, they did go to the mosque, but they were protected by the Constitution. Mona couldn't sleep. Brandon tried to set her mind at rest. They were blessed in America by the protection of our Constitution. And there we are going to pause for the evening, dear listener. We are now at the end of our hour, but we will be back next week to read more of this chapter. Tiger, you have any closing remarks before we depart for the evening? I don't think so. Um, I do have a lot of law that I can interject here, but I think it would be better to lead off with it uh, on the when you continue later. Yeah, good thinking. Yeah, let's collect our thoughts, everybody. Let's uh, let's think about this for the next week, right? Let's think about the fact that this isn't just happening to a certain targeted demographic in the crosshairs of the media right now. This is something that has been FBI practice for 20 years, and they have been sharpening this, honing these skills, getting worse and worse, more unaccountable for two decades. And then let's come back to this. Next, Bear Sengedrick says, how many feds are listening to this stream and grinding their teeth? God, if only a handful would listen to this and think, my God, what have I been doing with my life? Repent. Change your life. Quit the FBI. Go get a real job. Good night, everybody. Die.